Well, good morning. I uh, hope all of you had a wonderful week, and we're glad that you were able to come and worship with us today. It's been kind of a crazy week for our family um, as we celebrated Nathan's birthday last night, and we had homecoming for our oldest two, and it's just been a crazy week. But throughout this week, one thing I realized is how grateful I am for community, um, for being able to do life on life together and allowing us to really be a witness for our community at the same time to be loved um, by our community as well. And I pray that it'll be a reminder to all of us as you and I live in this broken and fallen world as we are kingdom citizens that we would live in a way that it would be attractive so that others would long to know the gospel that is being displayed throughout our, our lives. That we would truly be the lights and the salts of this world indeed. And I pray that today, as we come and we worship our God and King, that we would know who He is and that we would see the splendor and the glory so that we would desire to be the salt and light in this world. So this morning, can we all rise as we come before God's presence and as we hear God's call to worship, may you love Him today with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. For this is God's call to worship from Psalm 31, verses 21 through 24. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. I have said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Love the Lord, all you saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. This morning, can we truly love him? Can we love the Lord with all that we ha have? Because he has wonderfully shown his steadfast love to us indeed. Let us pray. great is your steadfast love, O Lord, that is new every morning. How great is your faithfulness. Your steadfast love that's displayed in spite, Lord, of all of our shortcomings, all of our faults, all of our weaknesses, in spite of the fact that, God, that we don't love you the way that you ought to be loved with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all our mind, but that's exactly how you love us, with all that you have with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And Father God, throughout this week, we have witnessed it through your faithful provision, through your grace, that the fact that each morning that we're able to awake and to experience your goodness over and over again. And for Father, that we are grateful. And Father, that's why we come to celebrate and to worship, to remind ourselves that God, that you are the only one and only true God. The one God who is worthy of our hearts, of our love, and our allegiance. So, Father, I pray that as we come and as we worship, I pray that together, Lord, that our hearts will be lifted up and that, God, that you'll be glorified. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. on the 
stars in the sky. Jesus, your love. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, Lord of heaven. Jesus, Lord of heaven. The grace that you have given For the promise of your word Lord, I stand in wonder At the sacrifice you made The mercy being measure my day you freely paid your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in Your 
mercies are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Every good and perfect gift. Every good and perfect gift in your endless grace you give. Flowing from the Father's heart to mine, beams of heaven, beams of heaven as I go through this wilderness below, the fullness of your love for all of time, all your mercies rising, all your mercies rising in this heart again. My soul begins to sing They are new every morning New every morning Great is your faithfulness Your mercies are new every morning New every morning Great is your faithfulness rising all your mercies rising in this heart again all your mercies rising in this heart again all your mercies rising forever shining in this grateful heart again true it is and how beautiful it is knowing that his mercies are new every morning indeed and not only do we sing our songs but we also take time to confess to the things that we hold on to as a body of christ and today we're going to be looking at the westminster shorter catechism question number 33 and again as we do every sunday i read the question and ask you to respond by reading the answer and so question 33 asks what is justification Amen. Amen. Today we just recited perhaps one of the most crucial doctrines of our Christian faith, the doctrine of justification. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther says that upon this doctrine, the church stands or falls indeed. And the thing is about justification is that God is the one who declares us to be not guilty. And so often people wonder whether or not that's a fictitious doctrine. Because how can he declare us not guilty when you and I have sinned? when you and I are guilty because we have failed to keep the law that God has asked us to live by. So therefore, is it a misnomer? Is it a fictitious statement? And the answer is no. And the reason why is because of our great substitute, Jesus Christ. For it is Christ is the one who has lived that life on our behalf. And he is the one who has paid for the wages of our sin by shedding his own blood upon that tree. So that when God sees us, he sees the perfect righteousness of Christ in us. And that is why we are declared not guilty, because of what Christ has achieved for us. And how is this justification ours? Not by the things that we do, but simply by faith alone. By faith alone, by putting our trust and our hope 
in what Christ has done for us indeed. And my dear friends, I pray that you will see the beauty of this doctrine. It would not be something that we take for granted, but that we celebrate, because that is our hope and stay indeed. And therefore, in response, I'd like to ask you to join with me as we sing our wonderful hymn, More Love to Thee, O Christ. And I pray that this will be the prayer of your hearts, especially today, as we hear God's word based upon these truths. More love to Thee, O Christ, more love to Thee. Hear Thou the prayer I make on bended knee. This is my earnest plea, more love, O Christ, to Thee, more love to Thee, more love to Thee. Once earthly joy I craved, saw peace and rest, now Thee alone I seek, give what is best. This all my prayer shall be, more love, O Christ, to Thee, more love to Thee, more love to Thee. Let sorrow do its work, Come grief for pain, sweet are thy messengers, sweet their refrain. When they can't sing with me, more love, O Christ, to thee, more love to thee, more love to thee. Then shall my latest breath whisper thy praise. This be the parting cry my heart shall raise. This still is prayer shall be more love, O Christ, to thee, more love to thee. More love to thee. Amen. Amen. As we just saying that we would ask God that we would have more love for him indeed. That we would truly love God with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And this morning the question that we have to ask ourselves is, have we done this? Have we loved God with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds, with all of our strength? And the second is like it, have we loved our neighbor as ourself? So often, what does it mean for us to love God with all of we have, all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strength? It means that you and I are willing to obey the word of God. Because you see, the law, truly, the way that it is fulfilled is through love. Love for God and love for neighbor. To think about the Ten Commandments, the very first four focus on our love for God and our love for neighbor, right? And the last six are love for neighbor. And that's why love it really is the fulfillment of the law. If that is the case, then what does it mean for us to love God is by obeying his commandments, by doing the things that he asks us to do and not to do. And yet so often, we have failed to do so. We have failed to love him the way that he ought Instead of worshiping the one and only true God and loving him, we have set up idols and we have loved them more than we have loved the one and only true God indeed. And that's why the Lord invites us to a time of repentance, to acknowledge once again of our shortcomings and our failures. But it's in that moment as we confess our sins that we're reminded of how high and how wide and how deep his love is for us as if you and I would think it ridiculous to love him with all that we have, but yet he is worthy, then how much more ridiculous is the fact that God would love us with all that we have, 
the fact that in spite of the fact that you and I have sinned and have failed against him, but he does. That is why the assurance of pardon of sin, it is such a great comfort and peaceful to our souls. Because it reminds us that he has forgiven us and that he loves us. So this morning, can we come before the Lord with all of our sins and all of our failures and acknowledge before him? Let us pray. And the word of God declares, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And my dear friends, today, if you have confessed your sins because you have put your hope in Christ alone, who is your justification, that as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I declare to you today that your sins are forgiven you as far as the east is from the west. And may the wonder and the splendor of this love bring you great comfort and joy and peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. In response to assurance of the pardon of sin, can we all rise as we bring our offering and tithes before the Lord? and seeing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated at this time. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for the privilege to gather together in this place to lift up your holy name in worship today. We thank you for your ever-present grace in our lives as you challenge our faith daily refining our devotion and love to you as you complete the work that you started in our lives. Yet we acknowledge that we are easily distracted. We are too easily satisfied by the short-lived joys we experience in our lives and by chasing after the next new thing. We pray that you grant us understanding that our longing hearts are often not satisfied because we are striving after counterfeit gods. We pray that you shine your light of holiness in our lives, illuminating the dark areas where we have not given you full reign those areas we hold close to our hearts so as not to lose our grip of control over them. Help us to find free freedom in Christ by giving them over to you, our God most high. We ask that you continue to walk alongside and support our members who are struggling and experiencing trials that stretch their faith. Be with Paul's family as they continue to mourn, and we especially ask for your Holy Spirit to strengthen his mother who is struggling to navigate life after losing her husband so suddenly. We ask that you continue to work in the lives of Yuma, his mother, and his family. We know that in these difficult situations, we cannot understand why they occur, but we pray that you would be glorified and your gospel message would be magnified as they persevere through this trial. We pray for the Chas in Japan. We are encouraged by the love and devotion that they continue to demonstrate, and we ask that you continue your work in their lives, sanctifying them and illuminating areas of pain, bringing them to repentance and understanding. And be with Aliyah and Michaela and reassure them of your presence and watch over them. And may they see the power of the Holy Spirit healing their family. We pray that you would also work in the lives of the limbs as they continue to serve you in Cambodia, equipping the Cambodian leaders to more effectively spread your gospel message to the lost. As we continue in our worship today, we refresh our hearts in Christ and renew our weary bodies to continue your work in this world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Well, this morning, I have to ask you, to, for the, at the time, our children are dismissed to go to Sunday school for the, little, the, for the little ones. But for the rest of us, I have to ask us to open our Gospels to so the Gospel of Mark. 
And we're going to be looking at chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. And we're going through this book of Mark right now. And I pray that uh, it's been an encouragement and a blessing to all of you. So we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. And this is the reading of God's holy and precious word. May you pay close attention to it. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You truly said that he is one, and there is none other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more than all whole burnt offering and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. May God bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Now, for all of us, I'm sure that you and I all have heard the saying before, so close and yet so far, right? So close and yet so far. I remember a couple years ago that during the Super Bowl when the Seattle Seahawks were on the goal line, right? That's like the last play of the Super Bowl against the New England Patriots. And this is for all the glory to be Super Bowl champions. And we remember that moment when they decided, rather than running the ball and giving it to Marshall, Marshall Lynch, that Pete Carroll, for some unknown reason, decided, you know what? We're going to decide. We're going to pass the ball, right? All they had to do was run the ball and get it in there, and they're Super Bowl champions, right? And instead, they passed it, and they got intercepted. And just like that, the Super Bowl was over for the Seattle Super Seahawks, right? They lost. So close, and yet so far, right? And maybe we've all been there, right? Being so close and yet so far. And it's absolutely painful. It's excruciating. And so often being so close and yet not there, it is absolutely devastating, right? Think about that for a moment. Like imagine if you were so close to entering the Hall of Fame, being so close to winning the presidential election, being so close to getting that promotion. Or for the kids, being so close of getting the A on that test or getting that B on that test. Or so close of winning the school ASB election or whatever it may be. And you always wonder like, gosh, if I did a little bit more, if I just did this or did that, then maybe I would have been able to get in. And so often people that often get that close have so much regret because they always wonder what could I have done a little bit different. But what makes it worse is in those moments when you know that there are no second chances, right? You only have that one chance, and when you lose that chance, it is gone forever. And that's what we see in our narrative today. For what is shocking is the answer that Jesus will give to this young man, this scribe, when he says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You are not far from the kingdom of God. In other words, you are so close to getting into the kingdom of God, but yet you are not in the kingdom of God. As the saying goes, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. It doesn't matter how close you are. What matters is whether or not you are in. And for this man, for this scribe, it's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of eternity. It's a matter of whether you're not going to spend eternity in heaven or you will spend eternity in hell indeed. And the reason why he tells this man, you are not far, was not to discourage the man, but to encourage the man to study to search, to not give up, because you are on the right path. You are on the verge. You are so close. You just got to finish that line. Cross the finish line. You are not far from the kingdom. You see, Jesus is the king of this kingdom. 
For this is why he has come. From the very beginning in Mark chapter 1, he said that what? The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Why is the kingdom of God at hand? Because Jesus has come. Jesus is the kingdom of God. And he's telling the young man, in order for you to enter this kingdom, you have to repent and believe in the gospel. But yet you are not far, far from this kingdom. And that's why the morning, this morning, we have to ask ourselves that question. Are you far from the kingdom? Are you near the kingdom? Or are you in the kingdom? You see, my friends, this is a matter of life and death. It makes all the difference in the world. Then how is it that we get into this kingdom? This is what we want to see this morning. For you see, this morning we see that the scribe, just like the other teachers of the law, come to Jesus to ask a question. And understand, in Mark chapter 12, we see that last week we saw how the Pharisees and the Herodians were trying to trap Jesus by asking the question, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? They wanted Jesus to be arrested. They wanted Jesus to be in trouble. Either get arrested by Rome by saying, no, you should not pay taxes, or that he will be seen as a fraud by the Jewish people if he were to say to pay taxes. Why? He will be seen as a collaborator and a traitor. That's why they asked that question. Earlier also, Mark chapter 12, we see the Sadducees come. And they question about marriage and the resurrection. Why? Because again, they want to trap Jesus. But this situation here is a little bit different. I believe this man, as he sees Jesus ask, answer the questions by these other religious leaders, sees that this man is wise, that Jesus is a wise man, that he's different. He is a great teacher. And when he asked, comes before him, he really wanted to know the answer to his question. Which commandment is the most important of all? You see, he did not come to confront Jesus he wanted clarification from Jesus. He was seeking to understand. He did not come with his mind made up, but he came to make up his mind. So often is our approach to Christ that makes all the difference in the world. For many people, they want to confront him. They want to show him to be a fraud. But there are others who want clarification to understand what he's saying or ultimately who he is. And that's what this scribe is trying to do. What is the greatest command? What is the most important commandment of all? Because you see, there are 613 commands of God. 613. And we know that 248 were positive and 365 were negative. Right? That's what these laws are. And even the religious leaders would argue among themselves. Out of these 613 commands of God, what is the most important? What is the more important because there are so many? What is that one commandment that supersedes all the others? Because here's the thing. If you can't do the most important one, then what is good to do all the others? Right? Right? you got to start with, the, start with the most important, because if you can't do the most important, then everything else really doesn't seem to matter, right? And I can see the logic behind it. And that's why they're asking, what is the most important commandment? And we see Christ's clear answer. Again, he does not try to avoid it. He doesn't want to try to avoid hardship. But his answer is very clear. He says, the first of all the commandments is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the very first commandment. To love God with all that you have. And understand for the Jewish people, this is a, something that they knew very well. It was part of the Shema. Taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6. That every morning and every evening, that these Jewish people will recite the Sumo to remind them of what God, who God is and what God has done for them and what God desires for them. The Shema is like the Lord's Prayer for every Christian, right? We all know the Lord's Prayer in the same way they all knew the Shema. 
They knew what God required of them. It was to love God intensely with every part of your being. That this is the most important, to love God and to love your neighbor. Think about it. Of all the commands, he commands us to love. To love. So often when you and I think about love, you don't think of love as being a command. You think of love being a feeling, right? You think of love being an emotion. But here the Word of God tells us that, no, love is something that we do. It is something that is volitional. That whether or not you feel it or not, that you are still called to love indeed. In other words, it is a choice that we make. And you see, ultimately, as I said before, that love is perhaps the fulfillment of all the love, a loss. That when we think about all the commandments of what not we should not do and what we should do, He gives us these things so that you and I will be able to love God and to love our neighbor. For what does it look like for us to love God? It's by doing these things and not by doing these things. What does it look like loving our neighbor by doing these things and by not doing these things? And we can see why loving God with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our mind is the most important commandment. As a matter of fact, Pastor Tim Keller says, love defines the lawful life. Love defines the lawful life. In other words, the law shows us how we can love him. But it's not only that we love him, but it says that we ought to love him with not simply our hearts, not simply our souls, not simply our minds or our strength. But he says to love him with all our hearts, all our soul, all our minds, all our strength. In other words, the commandment requires of a, not a moderate or superficial love, but it's a very intense love. It demands all that we have, all of our minds, all of our soul, all of our strength, all of our hearts. You see, this is what God calls us to do in this commandment. Not simply to love, but to love Him with a very intense love. You see, this love is radically different, perhaps, in the love that we see in this world. A love that is often moderate, a love that often superficial. We may love things in the world with our hearts, but so often we don't love them with our minds or our souls. Or we may love them with our feelings, but with not with our minds. We love with our thoughts, but our hearts are not there. So often the things in the world that we do, the love that we express, is so often moderate and superficial and weak. And it's so often not intense. And maybe the reason why it's not intense, because there are not things in this world that will cause us to love them with such intensity. That does not demand all of our hearts, all of our soul, all of our minds. But yet the reason why this one does, the reason why God demands this type of intensity, why God demands this kind of love, is because who He is. The Lord is one. It says that there is no other God, that he is the one and only true God. And that is why he deserves this intensity. This is why he deserves this love. As William Car Barclay, the commentator, says, it is a love which dominates our emotions, which directs our thoughts, and which is the dy dynamic of all of our actions. It is that intense indeed. You see, God does not say, worship the Lord. He does not say, serve the Lord. He says, to love the Lord. You see, because this is who He is. He is the one and only true God. He stands apart from all the other gods. He is not an impersonal God, but yet He's a very personal God. He's not a generic God, but a personal and relational God. He is a God who is love, as 1 John 4, 8 tells us, that God is love. That the one true God is a Trinitarian God. Three persons, and yet one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And before all eternity, they loved one another with all their hearts, with all their soul, with all their mind. And when God created all things, He wanted others to join and share in that love, that intense and glorious love. 
so that they will know the fullness of what love ultimately is. This is why he says, love God with all your hearts, with all your souls, and with all of your minds. But John goes on to say in 1 John 4, 9, and this is the love of God was manifest toward us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might, love, that we might live through him. You see, God manifested that love. That's how we know the intensity and the depth and the width and the height of this love manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. But as if that was not enough, Christ gives the scribe more than he asked for because the scribe only asked what is the first of all the commandments. But Jesus adds a second by saying, love your neighbor as yourself. He quotes Leviticus 19, 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now you wish that he would not add that one, right? Why can't we just love God and just hate our neighbor, ignore our neighbor, forsake our neighbor, right? Because loving God is understandable, like I said before, because he is one. There is no other God. And we see that love manifested in his son. God is worthy of our love. He deserves all of our hearts, all of our soul, and all of our minds because of who God is. But our neighbor... Love our neighbor as ourself. So often that is the part that is so difficult. That is the one that is so hard. And we wonder why can't we just love God and ignore our neighbor and care less about our neighbors. But here's the reason why. Anyone who loves God with all their hearts and with all their soul and with all their minds, the natural outflow will be love for your neighbors. That when you love God with all that you're, you're immersed in that love, the overflow of that love will go through you and spread like fire to all those who are around you. That you will love your neighbor, neighbors as well. For what does it mean to love God? It means to love our neighbors. Because you see, how can we say that we love God and hate our neighbors? That is absolutely hypocritical. As a matter of fact, I believe in this world, that is the worst witness that we can have. Here we are worshiping God and saying we love God, but yet we hate our neighbors. What does that say to our neighbors? What does it say to the world? It's the worst witness possible because we don't show them the very love of God. We don't show them the very heartbeat of God. And especially during this pandemic, so often, rather than loving our neighbors, we only loved ourselves. We only loved our church. And we have turned so many people away from the very love of God by the way that we have conducted ourselves with our neighbors, with our masks, with the vaccines or whatever you may believe in. And we ask ourselves, how can we say we love our God, but yet we hate our neighbors indeed? But who is our neighbor? Who is this the one that God calls us to love? And we know the parable of the great Samaritan. That is not only people that we get along with, the people that we like, the people that are part of our socioeconomic class, but even our neighbor. For it was that Samaritan who stopped to help that Jewish person, his enemy, in that pit. And what did he do? He came, took him out of that pit, paid for his medical bills, paid for his housing, and was even willing to pay even more to help his neighbor. This is the one that God calls us to love. In the same way, how much are we to love them as ourselves? As we love ourselves. Let me tell you right now, there is nothing more that we love than ourselves. Right? Right? So often we hear people, well, we can't love others until we first love ourselves, right? I can't love other people because I don't love myself. And here's the thing, my friends. You can say that, but the reality is that we have a tremendous love for ourselves. Everything we do is because we love ourselves. The reason why we get sad is because we feel like we deserve more out of life. The reason why we get depressed is because we deserve, we feel like we deserve more out of life. We love ourselves tremendously. 
So often we love ourselves more than we love God. Let's be honest and real. But it's to that degree, the way that we love ourselves, that we ought to love our neighbors. Indeed. You see, that is the command. To love God to that degree. And to love our neighbor to that degree as well. But here's the thing. How can we love our neighbor as ourselves then? It is only when we love God with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds, that we can truly love our neighbor. For we love our neighbor best when we love God first. We love our neighbor best when we love God first. It's because God will give us the strength and the motivation even when we feel like we cannot. He will give us what we need to love our neighbors the way they ought to be loved. C.S. Lewis once said this, When I've learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better, better than I do now. In so far as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God and instead of God, I shall be moving towards a state in which I shall not love my de earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed but increased. Oh, I love that. When I've learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. In so far as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God and instead of God, I shall be moving toward the state in which I shall not love my earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed, but increased. You see, this is why they go hand in hand. When we love God with all that we have, it is then we love our neighbor even better. And we see that in the Ten Commandments. The first four deal with what our love for God. And the last six deal with our love for our neighbors. This is what God calls us to do. This is the most important commandment of all. Today I ask you, are you obeying it? Are you obeying it? Hearing these words, what do you think the scribe's response should have been? If it were me, I'd be like, I'm screwed. Who can do this? Who can love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? And who can love your neighbor as yourself? I can love my neighbor to a certain degree. I can be nice to them once in a while. But to love my neighbor as myself, who can do these things? And I would say to him, I would say, God, this is hopeless. This is impossible. Then what hope do I have? But instead, the scribe responds by saying, Teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God and there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength. And to love one neighbor as yourself is more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. The scribe affirms what Christ says. You are right. There is no other God. And this God is worthy of all that we have. We ought to love him. We ought to love our neighbor as ourselves. As a matter of fact... This is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Whoa. He takes it to another degree. He says going to church and doing all these things, burning the sacrifice and giving our offerings, it means absolutely nothing unless we love. If we don't love God with all that we have, we don't love our neighbor, then why should we bring our offerings? It is absolutely hypocritical. And did not God say that in the Old Testament? I hate your offerings because your hearts are so far away from me. And so often the irony is, is that the reason why they bought these burnt offerings and sacrifices was in order for them, for, in order for God to love them. This is why they often did it. They didn't do it out of love for God. They did it out of obligation to God. Because they, want, they wanted to remain in God's love. That's why they offered these sacrifices. This is why they offered their offering. To remain in God's love. But what the scribe is saying, Jesus, you're right. 
is that we ought to offer these burnt offerings and sacrifices because we love God. We don't do these to remain in God's love. We do these things because we love God. You are absolutely right. That this ought to be the expression of our love. Do we offer our sacrifice not because we want to? So often we don't offer our sacrifice because we want to, but we often think we feel like we have to. But this scribe understood to obey is better than sacrifice. That loving him is more important than our religious duty of offering sacrifices and burnt offerings. And yet that's why Christ says, you answered wisely. You are not far from the kingdom of God. The irony here is this. Jesus makes it personal now. You see, that when he asked the question to the scribe, he asked it generically, what is the greatest commandment? But now Jesus made it personal. He says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And I can imagine how unnerving that must have been for the scribe. The scribe never asked what he must do, but Christ is telling him what he must do. And he's doing this out of love, Jesus, for the scribe. You see, he answered wisely. He agreed with what Christ has said. He is, but yet he is still not in the kingdom. How could he agree and not be in the kingdom? How could he agree and yet be so close? He was a man who was religious. A man who was seeking. A man who wanted to please God. A man who wanted to understand the demands of God. A man who was willing to obey them. If he is close, then who can be saved? If he is close, then who can be in the kingdom of God? And as Jesus would say, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are impossible, are possible. Why is it that this man is so close, but yet not in? It's because he only sees Jesus as a teacher and not a savior. He only sees Jesus as a great a wise man, but not as Lord. He only sees Jesus as a prophet, perhaps, but not the king. You see, he answered, and he knows these things, but he was not willing to submit his life under these things of yet. And this is why Jesus, by telling him, you are not far from the kingdom, he is saying to him, keep studying, keep searching. Because when you hear this commandment and you say that it is impossible to obey, that's when you realize I need a Savior who can save me from my sins. Because I can't love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. I don't love my neighbor as myself. Then who will save me from my wretched condition? And that is why with man it is impossible. But with God all things are possible. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus would lay down his life. To be your Savior, to be your Lord. And to bring you in the kingdom. Please understand, my friend, there are those who are far from the kingdom. Who are those far from the kingdom? There are those who are not willing to submit to the authority and the lordship of Christ. They are the ones who will not listen and agree with what Christ has to say. That their hearts are so cold and turned off by the reality of Christ. And the reason why is because they want to be the Lord of their own lives. They, want, they don't want anyone to tell them how they ought to live their lives. They want to live their lives the way that they want to live their lives. They want to sit on that throne. They want to be the king. They want to do whatever they want to do because they believe that I will find the fulfillment and the joy of life. Let me live my life the way that I want to live. Those are the ones who are far from the kingdom. The ones who are far from the kingdom are those who want to confront Christ. And they don't want clarity from Christ. They're the ones whose heart are so bitter and angry and turned off by the reality of the gospel. Those are the ones who are far from the kingdom. But there are those who are like the scribe, 
who are so close to the kingdom. They know that Jesus came. They know that Jesus died. They know that the body of Jesus is missing. They hear the words of Jesus and they believe he's a great teacher. His morality is excellent. His wisdom is beyond all other wisdom. He is a very wise man. But that's where they stop. They respect him. But they don't want to submit to him. They acknowledge him. But they don't want to give up their lives for him. They recognize that he is a great leader. But yet they don't recognize that he is Lord. For that is who Jesus is. Then who are those who are in the kingdom? They're the ones who repent and believe in the gospel. They're the ones who repent of their own sinfulness. They repent for all of their failures. But not only do they repent of their own sinfulness, but they repent of their own righteousness. That all my righteousness are like filthy rags. That no matter how good I think I am, I am still not good enough. And they believe in the gospel. That in spite of my sins, in spite of my wickedness and my wretchedness, in spite of my righteousness, I believe that Jesus has come to be my Savior and my Lord. That Jesus saved me from my wretchedness and my supposed righteousness. That Christ is the one who went to a cross and shed his own blood to wipe away my sins. And to give me his perfect righteousness. That when I stand before God one day, that he will see the perfect righteousness of Christ in me. And will say, welcome home. You see, that is the difference. It's not simply knowing, my friends. You see, you could go to your church your whole life. You can listen to your sermons all your life. But unless you repent and believe in the gospel, you are not in the kingdom. Unless you acknowledge that you are lost and hopeless apart from the mercy and the grace of Christ, you are not in the kingdom, my friends. You have to believe. You have to acknowledge that Christ is my Savior and my Lord. And apart from Him, I have no hope. And I need Him indeed. And here's my friend. Here's the deal, my friend. You see, that's why Christ says in Mark 2, 17, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, Jesus is the one who loved God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, with all his strength. By being obedient to death, even death on a cross. And Christ is the one who loved his neighbor as himself. And he is the one who laid down his life so that you and I would be able to enter the kingdom. And that is why now, my friends, we love God with all that we have, all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. And we love our neighbors as an expression of our love for him, for the one who gave up everything for you and for me. And I pray that you would give your life to him if you have not already. That you would surrender your life to him. That you acknowledge that he is more than just a teacher, but that he is your Savior and your Lord. Let us pray. And this morning, I ask you again, are you far? Are you near? Or are you in? It's simply that simple. Is to receive him as Savior and Lord. To believe that he died for your sins, 
and he's lived that life for you. It's not about what you do. It's about what he has done. And I pray that as you respond and know this, that because of who he is, will you love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your love of your neighbor as yourself. Maybe the reason why we don't love our neighbors well is because we don't love God well. If we can love him well, then maybe we'll love our neighbors well as well. So today, can we just come with a sense of brokenness and repentance and maybe his love just shower you today so that you will find strength to live out this commandment both now and forevermore. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. Father God, we thank you for your love. For Father God, we see how much you loved us. You loved us with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You loved your neighbor as yourself because, Lord, we could not. We have failed to love God with what, the way we ought to love him. We failed to love our neighbor as ourselves. The God that we have failed to live by this commandment. Father God, if we cannot even do these things, that God, what hope do we have? And that's why, Father God, you came. You came to do that which we could not do. So that God, by your strength, by what you have done, that we will be able to now to endeavor to do so. Father, I pray that we will understand that's not simply about knowing it's about believing that God that we would see our need of a savior and that God that you are Lord and I pray that now in response God that for those who are close who have not yet have done so submitted their lives before you I pray that God that they would do so they will repent and believe in the gospel and enter the kingdom and for all of us who are in the kingdom and God, help us to love you with all that we have so that, God, that we can love our neighbors better, that we can love our neighbors as ourselves indeed. So, God, we thank you for this work, and we give you all the glory. And in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all rise for one last song as we make this the confession of our faith.
kindness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. By darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. Pray for my voice for the second service uh, that it will get through. It's been that kind of week. Uh, it was a fun week. Uh, a lot of things were going on for our family, and that's why I lost my voice throughout the week. And so, But I pray that all of you will have a wonderful and blessed week ahead of you. We want to share with you next Sunday, um, we actually have our 19th anniversary service. And so we're delighted to have uh, Reverend Robin Lee from New Life Presbyterian Church Escondido to come and speak for us. And so it will be a celebration. We're going to have lots of food, tacos, whatever. Uh, it's just to be a great day. So we would love to have you come and join and celebrate God's goodness and faithfulness all these years. Also, on November 14th, there was an email sent out by Yuma about Operation Christmas Child. And so we'll be collecting items to help create packages for those kids who are in need. So if you can help out, it will be greatly appreciated. Also, our home groups have started, and we're continuing through our journey, so we would love to have you join us in person or on Zoom. And if you want any more questions about our community groups, please talk with me as well. But without further ado, may you receive God's benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit that enables us to love God with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, with all of our minds, with all of our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Be with you now and forevermore. Amen and amen.